I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and I'm going to read just one verse, and that will be set the stage for our lesson this morning. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, there are things that do move us that keep us from abounding in the work of the Lord. Um, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 will twice use a phrase that talks about that discouragement. And the phrase that he uses is losing heart. Have you ever gotten discouraged over something and just kind of lost heart? It's easy to do, isn't it? And that is at the core of faithful Christian living. Recognizing our own experience and sources of discouragement and allowing God to encourage us and others to encourage us to remain faithful in spite of that. That's why this year we're focusing as our theme, be a Barnabas, encourage others. Encouragement is vital to our life and our walk with God. This past 13 months, I have officiated at more funerals than any other time of my ministry of 43 years. Both family and church family. And in the midst of that experience, I find myself offering words of encouragement. Because there's profound grief that family experiences. A profound sense of loss. And whether it is the loss of a loved one, it could be the loss of a job, it could be the loss of a friend over something. But we all have those experiences that deeply discourage us. And I want to encourage us this morning, especially as Paul is focused, he's going to hone in on one particular thing that's so crucial. Encourage us to always abound in the work of the Lord. And it's going to raise the question for us, do I know, do I have a clear sense, um, a clear sense of understanding what in my life is work for the Lord? What does that need to look like? What has kept me from doing that? Paul shared his own experiences of those difficulties and in our last passage this morning, I'm going to refer to one of those. And if you're a student of Paul, you know that those who have spent their lifetime studying in Paul's letters, uh, you may know this, there are several places where Paul gives a list of all of the things, the tough things that he experienced in life, in his Christian life. And these are called tribulation lists. And we're going to read one of those toward the end of my lesson. And I want you to look at all the things that Paul himself went through that could have discouraged someone. I'm thankful, uh, I think Levi went to the back, but I'm thankful Levi made his comment about Chloe. A dear brother in the Lord, faced with many obstacles, but boy did he persevere. And every time that I went to visit him, I, I went to enjoy fellowship with him and encourage him. I was amazed. I would walk away myself being encouraged in many ways. And that happens a lot when we reach out to encourage others. But our text for this morning, I just read a moment ago, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Uh, it's amazing. I want you to think about this. It took 57 verses of Paul talking about various aspects of the resurrection before he would get to that one verse. And that kind of goes against the way we think in our culture because a lot of times we'll tell people, just give me the bullet points. That's all I'm interested in. Give me the bottom line. Paul's never interested in the bottom line. <laughs> he makes you wade through tons of stuff before you can grab that nugget, that gold nugget, the bottom line. You know why Paul does that? Is because 
encouragement to abound in the work of the Lord is not just something good for a preacher or elders to say that want everybody in the church to be involved. No, that's not the basis of it. It comes out of the foundation, and Paul ties it very closely to our understanding of Jesus' resurrection, anticipating our own resurrection. We say we have a belief in the doctrine of resurrection. Well, that's good, but it doesn't stop there. It becomes the foundation for our abounding in the work of the Lord. We're going to look at the different dimensions this morning of what that means. So how am I to be? If I, if I want to be encouraged in the work of the Lord, what does that mean I'm supposed to be like? Well, first of all, he begins calling them beloved brothers. NIV wants to be inclusive in that language. We're not, we're not omitting the sisters. It says beloved brothers and sisters. But as brothers and sisters in Christ, we're beloved. Do you realize that? We are loved and we're beloved. Beloved means I stand in the state of being loved and it's not going to stop. Now, if you think God has stopped loving you, you need to think again. It'll never stop. Now, God may not like some of the things that we think and do, but God's love will never stop. So being in the state of being beloved, then there are two descriptions for each one of us. First, we are steadfast. Paul says, I want you to be firm and steadfast. This means unwavering, resolute, unswerving. In 1 Corinthians 7, 37, uh, I had forgotten this. There's an amazing little reference to something. You may remember in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's trying to answer all these questions that come up about marriage. And it's, it's kind of fascinating because the Christian view of marriage went against a lot of the contemporary views of, of marriage in Paul's day. The Christian marriage is all about commitment, faithfulness, sexual purity. The emphasis was on that. So in that chapter, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 37, he's going to talk about a father steadfast, using the same word about being firm, a father steadfast, having made up his mind about the marriage ability of his virgin daughter. <laughs> now you think about that. Dads can get pretty involved in their daughter's futures. Steadfast about whether or not your daughter is of the age and is right for her to marry the guy you want her to marry. And so it's in that context that Paul will use this word firm and steadfast. Boy, dads can really get firm, steadfast about that. What a great illustration for that word. And then in Colossians 1.23, Paul says, If you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and you do not move away from the hope of the gospel, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, was made a minister." That is my prayer for you, Paul says. So think about that. Faith that is firmly established and steadfast. Here, here's the thing that struck me about that. What is there in our lives that potentially has the power to move us away from the hope of the gospel? What is it that potentially has the power to knock me off my tracks? To make me turn loose of my very deepest beliefs, my sense and purpose of life. Well, Satan knows this, and I would argue that one of the strongest tools he's got in his pack that he reaches down and pulls out is any little thing he thinks that will work that will move us away from that steadfast, steadfast hope of the gospel. And of course, for every person, I love Phil's prayer. It was really great about, oh, yeah, God knows us through and through. We know what we ought to be like, and we're not there yet. We're human, but Satan knows we're human too. And he's going to throw in the mix anything that he thinks will move us away from the hope that we've got grounded in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then the other word that Paul uses, immovable. What a great word. Not capable of being moved from its place. Firmly fixed. Permanent. Resolute. 
when my oldest daughter was learning to drive. And for those of you young fathers who have daughters that are learning to drive, I always say a special prayer for you. Your safety is in the hands of a young driver. Uh, both of my girls had different issues in learning to drive. Uh, one of them would always hop the corner and almost take mailboxes down. So we had to help her learn how to, to drive around the corner. And that, that was risky. Um, and then the other one was a speedster. I mean, had a heavy foot, didn't even think there was such a thing as a brake. And I'm over on the passenger side wishing there was a brake. So that, and I tell, that's why I have all these white hairs. You know, I went through that. But uh, when, when my oldest daughter was learning to drive, we had finished driving one day and she'd done great. We pulled up in the driveway and the, the house that we lived in had one of these little sheds, you know, that's attached to the back of it that goes down to the basement. Well, she thought she put her foot on the brake and instead she put on an accelerator. Boom! We hit that little shelter and it moved the whole thing off the foundation. And she looked at me real quick and her first thing was, now I want you to think about this. What do you think a 15 year old girl would say? Her first thing she said to her dad was, don't you tell mom. <laughs> and I said, okay, how do you propose getting this whole thing back on the foundation without mom noticing? So we were sitting there and mom came out and while we were scratching her head, Nancy said, well, why don't you just use the hydraulic lift that's in the back of your car that lifts your car up and it lifted up and put it back on the foundation. I thought, why didn't I think of that? So funny. So it's sometimes foundations you think are there and are solid and sure and steadfast and firm and won't move, they do. And that's the way life is. We gotta be careful because those foundations can be destroyed. Oh, there, there's so many wonderful examples of how this is used through the years. Uh, let me just give you one example. Uh, a papyri that was found dated around 30 B.C. Uh, there's a gentleman named Dionysius in this little letter. And he makes a comment about his friend Appius. And listen to this comment. Because he's going to use the same language that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He says, this is not the first time that I have had occasion to praise Appius as a man highly capable and uh, he's highly capable of grasping uh, consequences of things and thinking ahead. And as one, he always offered the most excellent and useful opinions, a man who was firm and unshakable in his judgments. And so Dionysius thought his friend Appius was a man who was firm and unshakable in his opinions and beliefs and convictions. It's almost as if when you put these two words together, firm and unshakable and steadfast that Paul's using in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, one Christian writer said it's a lot like Paul's trying to say, hold the line and don't give in. That's a fascinating expression because hold the line uh, comes from military background. In fact, I just uh, discovered last night there's a book out, on, and I, I love Civil War stuff. There's a book out called Hold the Line. And uh, it refers to one of the Civil War battles that was around Parkersburg, West Virginia. There was a significant battle, I think it was in 1863 in that area. But this expression in English, hold the line, comes from military background. It's also used an awful lot in football vocabulary. Uh, I was reading several blogs where uh, these young men who have trained their whole life for football, and especially if you're up on the front line and the coach says, you hold that line, and usually it's against the defensive guys trying to get at the quarterback. Hold the line and don't you dare give in. So we understand that concept. And this is what Paul is saying. So now, if I'm supposed to be firm and steadfast and unmovable, whose work is it? Paul's very clear about that. It's in the work of the Lord. I want you to progress in the work of the Lord. Ephesians 2.10, Paul not only says that we're saved by grace. You know, it's, it's one thing to be saved from something. 
It's quite another to be saved for something. Uh, I think there was a time in my Christian life in the past, I only thought of the fact that I'm saved from something. And, and I conceptualized that, well, I'm saved from hell. I'm saved from the devil. Um, you know, I'm saved from sin, and that's all I'd think about. Well, that's not where the New Testament stops. Yes, we're saved from, but guess what we're saved for? So in the same new birth that we come up as a child of God, remade in the image of Christ, we're saved for something too. Our baptism is a call for mission. It is a call for mission that says, God, I am now ready to be enrolled in your army. I'm now ready for the mission. Tell me what to do. That's why Paul says, I want you to always abound in the work of the Lord. So practically, what is it? The first and second commandment. Love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul and strength. And our neighbor as ourself. That's the foundation of it. The work in the Lord also starts with a submissive will to God's will. And again, I'm going to go back to, to Phil's prayer. It, Phil, thank you for that prayer. It was amazing because it tied in with some thoughts I was thinking about on my way here this morning driving on the road. That part of the Christian life very uh, foundationally is my constantly asking God, God, is my will really in submission to yours? Or am I just living life the way I want to live it? Am I really saying to you, Lord, I'm not myself anymore. I'm not mine. I'm yours. Then, since we are called for ministry, every one of us, I think having received or having come from the background of the Reformation movement, we have the wrong view of the minister. We think of the minister as the pastor. I'm sorry, that's not what I am. I am a minister. I can function as a pastor, but I'm not the. Don't call me the. I am not the minister, the pastor. You all are also ministers. We're all together called to ministry. Work in the labor of the Lord. What is that ministry? Serving needs, sharing good news, helping people come to Christ, praying with others, visiting the fathers and the widows in their affliction, that James says, giving to the needy, helping feed the hungry, giving clothes to those that need clothes, visiting people in prison, and the list could go on. Participating in the Love Bear Workshop, the list could go on. And it's not a legalistic list where that we've only got this short list and if I don't do something on that list that I find the New Testament, then I'm done for. And that's the way I think about it. No, 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 no. I see what is found in the New Testament is instructive. And it's designed, think about this, it's designed to give me a broad awareness of how I can daily respond to the needs of others, both with my unique opportunities, my unique giftedness, and my unique um, moment that I can make a difference in that person's life. So that I have the mind of Christ, compassion with conviction, that God can work in me and through me to make a difference for the kingdom. Accordingly... I want us to think about these three things the rest of this year. I've already talked about encouraging a person once a week. Go out of your way, however you, way, however you want to do it. Encourage somebody intentionally that maybe you wouldn't otherwise this week. The second thing to add to it, and this is a challenge for all of us, to move beyond our comfort zone and let's start inviting people to participate with us in the life of Christ. It may be invitation to the assembly on Sunday. It may be you inviting someone to your small group. It may be you inviting someone to a prayer group that you've got. It may be inviting someone to 
a coffee shop and just praying with them individually, one on one. But let us all together encourage one another to take that extra step to begin being the people of God who love to invite. And because, because this is so important, if I believe that the reason, one of the reasons I am here is that I like what I see, I, like to, I, I want to be a part of what God is doing here at Highland View, and if I deeply believe that, then let's not be selfish with that feeling, let's share it. If we think we've got a good thing here, well then let's share it, let's invite others to participate. So invite, encourage, and abound. This overwhelming, increasingly lavished by the love of God. Colossians 2.6 Therefore, as you have received Jesus Christ the Lord, he says, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So I know our time is up. I want to encourage you that when we ask the question, what is my reward? Knowing that your work in the labor is not in vain. The way Paul says it, it has the force of always knowing that. Every single day I wake up, I know that what I'm going to do for God is not wasted. That it has hope and confidence all wrapped up in it. That in the Lord, this is the realm of my Christian existence and work. And so that my labor is support, it is aid, it is sacrifice, it is encouragement, it is any way that I can help you. And I love this because Paul says, it's not in vain. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 5, there's a passage there. goes all the way from verses 1 through 5. I don't have time to read it, but Paul was concerned. And on occasions he expresses this. He was concerned that his labor in the Lord would be in vain. That he's spending all this time working for others and it would be in vain. And I think he got constant encouragement from God. No, Paul, your life's not in vain. I want you to listen to this very last thing. He says, now, you think that your life in God is what it ought to be? Paul says, if you're going to start comparing, okay, let's compare. As far as I have experienced, all kinds of labor and work. All kinds of imprisonments. And I wish Paul had been specific, but he didn't say this. Beaten times without number. Often in danger of death. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I've spent in the deep sea. I have been on frequent journeys, in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among many false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold exposure. Apart from such eternal thing, or external things, there's also the daily pressure on me about all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? He said, if you're going through all kinds of problems, Paul says, I take that on. Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Who's not going the wrong way without me losing sleep over it, Paul says. Oh, so Paul's ongoing struggle. Let's go to the last slide. I think it's our conclusion. I put it on there. Here's our takeaway challenge for today. Where do I need encouragement in my work for the Lord? What have I been discouraged about? Whom should I tell? Don't feel like that the Christian life is a lonely journey. It was never meant to be that way. I want to encourage you in your own specific life, in your own specific way, to always abound in the work of the Lord. And if you're not abounding, don't walk out of here this morning with an excuse. Come and tell us. We want to encourage you while we stand and sing.